to tell you about how we're putting disinformation out of business, how we are dismantling the disinformation economy. Slide best, yeah, merci. Uh, we started three years ago, January 2020, after figuring out for about nine months who each other were. My business partner, Nandini, and I started a newsletter called Branded. You can find it at checkmyads.org slash branded. And at Branded, we were just asking questions. We were two marketers. And we were wondering why our industry was creating the crisis that we see today. Why hate crimes were up, why fascism is on our doorstep, why COVID-19 uh, had so much disinformation associated with it. We realized that it was our industry that was causing the problem. So we started a newsletter and then we started an agency and then at the agency we realized that advertisers actually did not have control over their own ad campaigns. And we realized that we had to hold the ad tech system accountable. So that's what I'm here to talk to you about today. Next slide. I don't need to tell you that we are in a disinformation crisis or an infodemic. 30,000 jobs in America have been lost in the last 10 years. And $2.6 billion, that's not including Fox News, has been going to disinformation every year. So what do we do about it? Next slide. What we have realized is that the disinformation economy is the ad tech economy. Now, ad tech is estimated to be about $400, uh, sorry, $400 billion or $700 billion. Nobody knows how big it is globally. It could be a certain number or it could be almost double that. And we know that 15% of every campaign on average is called the unknown delta. It just disappears off the face of the earth. Now conservatively, if it is $400 billion, that's $60 billion that we don't know where it goes. Advertisers don't know where it goes. Ad tech doesn't know where it goes, or they claim to. And publishers don't know where it goes. We know it's not good people getting this money. That's $60 billion. Now think about it. If you're a propagandist, you need three things. You need legitimacy so that people believe your lies, right? You need money, and not that much. It's not as if you're hiring fact checkers. And you need data so that you can better and better target people who are susceptible to lies and hate. And the ad tech system gives these three things to propagandists. It is a weapon of propaganda. Because the ads themselves give legitimacy. These brands, they're Fortune 500s, they've been building their trust, their brand equity for decades. And now they're giving it away to people so that it looks like it, the website is trustworthy when it's not because, the, because their trusted brands are associated. Of course, the money and the data, the personal identifiable information of internet users. When you cut this information off from this industry, you cut them off from the weapons that they need to subvert our democracies and create more dangerous worlds. Next slide. In 2016, Breitbart had more web traffic than CNN.com or FoxNews.com combined. I know it's easy to forget now because Breitbart is no longer a part of our main media story, but they were going to make $8 million in 2017 after they had uh, worked to subvert the American election. And Steve Bannon himself, who is a self-described fascist, says that the real opposition is not the government. Hello, Mike. Oh, The real opposition is not the government. The real opposition is the media. And the way to fight the media is to flood the zone with shit. Things that sometimes are true and sometimes not true and it's really hard to decipher. And the goal is to scapegoat minority groups. And their playbook is to lie. Wow, you're going way too far ahead. Their playbook is to lie and then to multiply with ad dollars. And so what, we, what uh, my business partner did at Sleeping Giants before Check My Ads is they would let advertisers know when their ads were on Breitbart. It was a Twitter and Facebook campaign. They were, they were not a charity. They were not an organization or a, a company at all. They were just on Twitter and Facebook. And they let 4,000 advertisers know that their ads were there. 4,000 advertisers dropped Breitbart, blocked them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
31 of th uh, 35 ad exchanges dropped Breitbart entirely, thus cutting them off from ads, money, and data. And they were going to make $8 million in 2017, but Steve Bannon himself said that there's no uh, economic model without ads, they lost 90% of their revenue, and we don't even think about them anymore. Okay, that was way back in 2017. A lot has happened since then. And disinformation has gotten worse. And so we know that advertisers don't want to be funding disinformation. And yet, it's getting bigger. The problem is growing. Why is it happening? Oh, sorry. This is Bannon being sad. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. This is what the ad tech system looks like for most people. You're welcome to take photos. You're welcome to tweet about it. Uh, Cat the Kin on Twitter and Mastodon. Advertisers are on one side, and they want to meet consumers. And they know that consumers are reading sports, they're reading recipes, they're reading fashion, they're reading the news. Of course, a lot of the news. They're also reading disinformation, but advertisers don't want to be there. And it's hard to tell why the money, ads, and data are going to disinformation, even though they've been blocked. So what we do, a check my ad slide, is uncover this opaque box to figure out not what publishers are publishing disinformation, but what networks are supporting disinformation with ads, money, and data. This is an oversimplified supply chain of a Fortune 500 advertising uh, campaign. So you can see advertisers sometimes use a media agency, sometimes go in-house. Increasingly, they are going in-house because they cannot trust people along the supply chain. Uh, then they are, going, they are using real-time bidding or a direct media network to connect to publishers. And there are two types of ad exchanges. There's the ad exchange that brings the publishers to market and the ad exchange that brings advertisers to market. This is a very oversimplified version. For those in ad tech, don't correct me. We can talk about it later. There are maybe 20, really three, main ad, ad tech companies that are bringing the advertisers to market. They're called demand side providers or DSPs. There are hundreds and hundreds of supply chain providers bringing publishers to market, rebundling it, making it look a lot like the subprime mortgage crisis of 2008. And we don't know who owns some of these companies. They are banks of money, ads, and data. They collect it and redistribute it silently in what we call dark pools. And we can't tell who owns it. That means that the ad tech system is a weapon of propaganda. Thank you, next slide. Steve Bannon has a playbook, we also have a playbook. What we do is we follow the money and we alert the public to what's going on with our newsletter branded and on Twitter and LinkedIn. My business partner's very prolific on LinkedIn, Nandini Jami. Uh, and we demonetize disinformation networks. So we launched a campaign this time last year called Defund the Insurrectionists. It targeted the top six voices of the big lie that led to the insurrection on January 6th. Steve Bannon, Dan Bongino, Charlie Kirk, he's that millennial white nationalist who sent 80 buses to the insurrection. Tim Poole, some YouTuber just asking questions. Glenn Beck and Tucker Carlson at Fox News. And over the course of five months, we lost everyone except Fox News, their ads, money, and data. Thank you. Thank you. It wasn't that hard. We just had to tell advertisers where their money and ads and data were going. And then one after the other, ad exchanges just dropped them because they did not want to be caught in a lie. Ad exchanges tell advertisers, don't worry, we only work on premium publishers. We would never work with someone who spreads election disinformation, COVID-19 disinformation, hate and harassment. And yet we know over and over again that they only do the right thing when we shine sunlight on the problem. Uh, you might wonder if advertisers like us. The answer is yes. Uh, we represent advertisers on the supply chain. And they love finding out where their ads are going. 
Thank you very much for having me. Amazing, amazing. Go away, yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, let's just clap again. Come on. <laughs> A few brief questions. Does anyone have questions for Claire? Anything. Yeah. So how about the application They're calling it a triopoly now because Amazon's entered the mix and also TikTok is sort of kind of rushing the field. Uh, when I say disinformation economy, a lot of people think of Facebook. And it's true that Facebook amplifies and encourages disinformation. We know that. But it's not where disinformation makes money. Disinformation makes money when users click on the hate bait on Facebook and then get sent to a website where a dozen ad exchanges are waiting to serve them ads. And so while Facebook is the company that is promoting it the most, it is the business relationship between the ad exchange and the website that we are intervening. And when I say business relationship, I'm talking contracts, bank accounts, direct deposits. It's that business relationship that we are interrupting. It's what we call the disinformation economy. Uh, do you see a future where advertisement is transparent? Do I see a future where advertisement is transparent? Yes. Yeah, I think it has to be. Uh, the Digital Services Act in, in Brussels coming out of the European Union right now, they are trying to make that happen. Uh, the Internet Safety Bill in the UK is kind of trying to make that happen. Uh, there's no way forward otherwise. Ad tech is a huge bubble, and it is the thing that makes the Internet the way it is. And there's too much fraud and too much disinformation. And advertisers are going to flee if, if nothing changes. So we need to make it more transparent. I've been thinking about that problem for a yeah. while. I'm, I don't come from advertising. I come from, from tech. And, uh, I wonder if you see the work that's happening yeah. in decentralized web would help that. The question is how can a decentralized web help this problem? Yesterday I had a conversation with an investor who wanted to invest in Mastodon. Mastodon has been crazy because it's like one 29-year-old German guy who's been running it. It's, it's a massive success story, but... Uh, he just turned 30. He just turned 30. <laughs> <laughs> Their budget has been like $200,000 a year. It's, it's wild. Uh, but they have a disinformation problem. And they have a hate and harassment problem. And the, the only way to move forward with decentralization is to have nuance. And I know that I'm about to say something very controversial for this room, but you need centralized content moderation. You just have to. You have to have people, humans, who are responsible to, for keeping us safe. And I think decentralization has the opportunity to either save us if, if we are nuanced with our approach to decentralization, or really hurt us. And I think Mastodon is at a, or Ma Mastodon and anything else that is decentralized is at a inflection point where it's either gonna have a, a brand issue with an association with Nazis or not. Do you think disinformation is absolute or relative? I think it's relative, thank you for asking. Yeah, I think it's relative. It, we don't play in the gray area. Yeah, if someone says, you know, oh, you're left versus right, and this is, you know, I just want to have a political conversation, I just want to debate, that's totally fine. What we're fighting here is extremism, and we're fighting the intentional, repeated publication of lies that lead to violence. And yeah, it can be relative, but at a certain point, we have to get off our philo philosophical chairs and do something to save our communities. Um, coming back to kind of bridge these two questions about decentralization and about the antitrust litigation. Yeah. So if you have Google and 
Facebook and Amazon now in the middle of this ecosystem, and you break them apart through antitrust litigation, does that get inside the black box, or does it create a million little black boxes? The question is, like, how much can antitrust really help? Does it help with transparency? Uh, maybe. Antitrust has been helpful before and also has hurt before, because you end up with a bunch of uh, splintered, independent companies that end up working together anyway. Uh, if we have competition, then yes, absolutely. And that is the reason we are successful today, is because we, have, we, are, we focus on the open web. We don't focus on monopolies. And there are lots of ad exchanges competing for trust with advertisers, competing for that clientele. And so when we out them for bad behavior, for bad business practice, then they change. They change. But uh, Google and Facebook generally don't, unless you really humiliate them, which has worked. Last question. Hello. <gasps> Thank you for asking. Uh, what's the best way to get involved? Please go to checkmyads.org. There's two ways to sign up. You can sign up on our homepage for our newsletter. It goes out about once a month, and it's always dramatic. Uh, <laughs> so if you want to be entertained, uh, sign up at Branded. The other way is you can become a Checkmate. And uh, actually, there's three ways. So Checkmates are people who donate monthly to Check My Ads. Uh, it's what keeps us going. We are launching a book club soon. So uh, if you want to have conversations with us about what's in your heads, we want to know. Uh, and then the third way is we send action emails. When an ad tech company doesn't do our bidding, uh, we send them thousands and thousands of emails that say, hey, your terms of service say one thing, but your business practice says another. What gives? And we have 60,000 people on that email list, and we provide them with the email, uh, of the executive, their legal counsel usually, their name, uh, they hate that, and a uh, template that says, hey, your terms of service say this, but you're doing another thing. Um, it works very well, and uh, we've been doing this against the insurrectionists. This year, we'll talk more a lot about Google and other disinformation practitioners, especially people dealing with hate and harassment, because it's getting crazy. So thank you.